Awesome. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight to our Naturalist Nights and thank everyone for their patience with the weather and also thank Jenny for braving the snowy roads this evening to make it here and join us. Jenny comes to us from the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, which is a nonprofit organization committed to bird and habitat conservation and public education. Jenny got her bachelor's in wildlife biology in 2003, and then got her master's in biomedical sciences in 2007, both from CSU. And she's volunteered for a variety of agencies, working with multiple, agent, multiple avian species, and joined the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, or sorry, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory in 2009, and since has coordinated northern goshawk projects in five states. And that's what she's here to talk to us about tonight, is Northern Grasshawk. So if you guys will all join me in welcoming Jenny. Well, thank you for having me. And again, thank you for waiting. It's always interesting coming in on I-70, and you never know what you're going to get. So I didn't get the best thing, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> So again, my name's Jenny. Um, my official title is Northern Goshawk Project Coordinator, and that's for the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, so it's a fun mouthful. Um, I'm going to first talk about a little bit, just RMBL really briefly, just to give you some background on that, and then I'll talk about the goshawk work that I've done over the last um, three, four years. So our main mission, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory's main mission is to conserve birds and habitats. And as mentioned, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we were founded in 1988, so we're celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year. We just celebrated it last week, actually. Um, we have offices in Colorado, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And in Colorado, it's Fort Collins, Brighton. We have some, uh, uh, an employee in Grand Junction. In, uh, but we're headquartered in Bar Lake State Park, and that's in Brighton, Colorado. There's about 40 people who are employed full time, and those are scientists, educators, administrative staff. And then during this time of year, we start ramping up for the field seasons, and we'll have 75 to 100 temporary employees help us for the field seasons. Um, birds are our focus. It's, they, they're really cool. We really like them. Um, they're <laughs> biological indicators, um, and then you can find them anywhere. I mean, they live pretty much anywhere that you could think of an animal living. You know, and penguins are the only animals that live in Antarctica year-round. Um, they, the niche specialists, they're niche specialists, but then they're also generalists. So again, they're kind of everywhere. They are very specific to a, a location, or you can find the same species anywhere. Um, this says easy observe easily observable, and then I'm going to say later that goshawks are not. So it depends on the bird species that we're talking about, um, but there are a lot of birds out there that you can regularly see. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that because they're migratory, you have to put a little bit of more effort into working across borders. Um, and then also we have the birds, and then we have their habitat that they live in. And so we work with landowners and agencies to help improve that habitat for the birds that are out there. Um, and again, it's, it's education, it's science, it's all sorts of kinds of things that I'll talk about. And those benefit not just the birds, um, but it also benefits the people and then the other, the other plants and animals that live in that habitat. So Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, we have a full circle approach. We have stewardship. And that's mostly working with landowners. Um, so we go out there and we might do something as big as a big burn on a huge ranch to help get that grassland back to the kind of grassland it was, um, to something as small as a working with somebody in their backyard to get feeders and those kinds of things so that they could get a diverse um, set of birds in their backyard. And part of stewardship is education. So we do educate the landowners. But we also have uh, school age and even older adult programs where we, um, we talk about several different things. Anyway, you know, when you have little kids, you just basically talk about what birds are and why they're important. Then you have adult programs that get a little bit more into long-term effects and the science behind it. And then I work for the science team, and our primary goal is the data collection. And with that, with the science, one of the things that we do is the northern goshawk monitoring. 
And it's the main purpose of this bioregional monitoring is to determine goshawk population status and trends. So the trend is kind of more important to us than actually narrowing down an actual number. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and this is the bioregional is over a very large area, and I have some maps showing that. Um, that pretty much just says that. We work, I work, RMBO works with like 60 different partners. Uh, I basically work with the U.S. Forest Service and the Wyoming Department of Fish and Game. In uh, the Forest Service, we have two large regions. Region 2 is Colorado, Wyoming, and uh, South Dakota. And then Region 3 is the Southwest, so that's Arizona and New Mexico. I have a map that shows it. And then for the Wyoming, I work in the Bridger Teton National Forest. So this is the study area. And you can see there's like the Black Hills in South Dakota. We work all the way up to the Montana border and then through Colorado and then down into the Southwest all the way down to Mexico. I actually have a survey location that is right on the border. So what we do for this general bird monitoring is that we conduct broadcast acoustical surveys and there are 600 hectare areas. Uh, it's about two and a half kilometers by two and a half kilometers. We put a whole bunch of call stations in that area on 10 transects or lines. Again, I have a picture so you can see it. And then we have, we play audio of a goshawk and they play it at each of those locations and then the surveyors look and listen for the goshawk response. Um, and then it's considered occupied if a technician sees or hears a goshawk. And I, I don't know, we'll see if this, I don't know. If it's quick, it's no big deal. It's just more of a, to give you an idea of what my poor technicians have to go through all summer long. Let's give it a shot. That's okay. Hmm. It just, it's a goshawk calling and it's really annoying and they, they do it. <laughs> they do it up to 120 times in a day over and over and over again. So I really appreciate their effort. Um, so this is a primary sampling unit, a PSU, and you can see that's 120 call stations, each one of those dots. Um, a, there's a few reasons why we don't go to um, one of them if the terrain is too steep and it's dangerous. We don't make our technicians do that. Also, if it's in the middle of a meadow, you're not going to have a goshawk uh, respond to you because that's not where they live. Um, yep. So we do, we do the broadcast acoustical surveys twice. We do it once during the nestling period, and that's typically across their range in this part of the country, June. And then once during the fledgling period, and that's the fledgling goshawk there. Um, and that's usually early July through the end of August. And goshawks are, they're forest dwellers. That's why you don't check for them in the meadows. Um, and they're very aggressive. They're one of the most aggressive birds out there. So playing this call is really effective because, again, they are territorial. Um, and they'll come in and they'll check to see who else is in their territory. So that's one of the reasons why that broadcast acoustical survey works. The problem is, and I have some pictures a little bit later, is that you don't always see them. Is that um, broadcast acoustical survey done simultaneously? So the technicians, they walk to one of those locations. Oh, sorry, he asked, he asked if the surveys were done simultaneously. Yeah. Um, so again, they walk. Um, I mean, is, there, is there a sound at each one of the locations at the same time? Or they, so during June, they play uh, the adult call, and it's just the adult call throughout June. Mm -hmm. And then in... Um, July and August, you play, you play the juvenile songs. Um, but at each location, you just play one of those, one of those calls. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have our sampling units spread out. Um, in Region 2, it was random. It, they just put it into a computer program, and it just kind of spit out random numbers, and they chose those. Um, and again, you can kind of see we had higher concentration in the Black Hills because they paid us more money. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Bridger Teton, they're the ones just on that west side of um, 
Wyoming. Again, they gave us more money, so we spent more time there. And then down in the southwest, it's spread out. At each of those dots, is it just one in the two and a half kilometer by two and a half kilometer sampling site, or that, is it multiple? That's correct. So she asked if it was just one of those sampling units or it's multiple. That is, each one of those dots represents that grid with the 120 call stations. All right. So you can, we do this thing in, in Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. It's called stratification. Um, and you do it for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is if you want to figure out something specific about a location, and that could be administrative. So the Black Hills want to know more about goshawks. So you can stratify by like the Black Hills. Or you could do it by habitat type. So do they live, do they occupy uh, ponderosa pine more than they occupy pinyon juniper? So you can kind of do those stratifications based on the land attributes. Or you can do it based on financial restrictions. So we have easy access and difficult access. Easy access is theoretically cheaper than the difficult access. Um, so again, we do it by habitat, and I have pictures of the different habitats. And then, um, and then the access is, so we, in some places we use distance to roads or forest service stations or just administrative classification. So in Region 2, again, that's Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota, primary habitat is the mixed conifer forest, so lodgepole pine, um, ponderosa pine, and then up into where kind of the subalpine fir starts. And then the marginal habitat is the pinyon juniper, like on the west slope, um, and then the subalpine fir, the true subalpine fir forests. And one of the reasons why primary habitat in this region is better is you can kind of see how much more spaced out that upper left forest is than the one down here. And it's easier, they don't tell us, but we think that it's easier to hunt in that thicker forest, or the less thick forest than it is in that denser forest. It's easier to find animals that they eat. So then region three in the southwest, it's a little bit different. They occupy a slightly different forest set. So in that upper left, that's ponderosa pine forest. And then it's the pinyon juniper. Um, down in the, again, in the southwest. So this kind of shows the map of the forest in Arizona. I have one of New Mexico we won't spend too much on. And the kind of the beige color, it's grassland. It's in the Forest Service. It's in the administrative boundaries of the Forest Service, but it's not forested land. So we didn't do any, any surveys in that location. And then the brown is pinyon juniper, and then the green is the ponderosa pine. So in the southwest, we use a slightly different method. It's a um, totally it's a spatially balanced design, and basically it picks a random point to start with, and then it tries to pick a location that's far away from that original site, and then it kind of goes through the whole forest depending on how you stratify uh, that forest. So it helps spread it out better. In this case, in Arizona, it's really crazy because I ended up with two in Flagstaff, <laughs> which there's, a, there's goshawks in Flagstaff, but. And then Arizona, or New Mexico, it's the same kind of deal. And then the red ones show where we saw goshawks. So the Gila National Forest down here in the southwest um, actually had a pretty high incident of uh, detection. And then the Kaibab is also a hot spot for goshawks in the southwest. So in 2009, these are just numbers. Basically, you could just take out the bottom. It, we got 68 detections throughout the whole summer, um, and that they did really prefer that what we called primary habitat. We really did get more detections in there. And then we saw more goshawks early in the summer than we did later in the summer. And then in Region 3 in the southwest, we only got 25 detections. Um, but 17 were in that ponderosa pine, and only a few were in Actually, 23 were in the ponderosa pine, and only three were in that other one. Again, more detections early in the summer. So when we do this again, I'll probably use this information and concentrate more in that primary habitat in that ponderosa pine. Question? Mm-hmm. Do you, do you have a model that allows you to project 
out the total goshawk populations from the detections you had? So he asked if I have a model that, that does uh, population <coughs> estimates um, from this information. And I'll get, I, yes. And well, no, no problem. I, I think it's, a, no, no. Okay, so we have detection probability and occupancy. So science, math, stuff. Um, so if you go out and you can count every bird, then you get, you get a population estimate. Um, and you assume that your detection probability is one when you're using just kind of that simple stuff. And that means if you have one, you detect every goshawk in the forest. If you're walking through a forest, yeah, right, you're going to see every bird. It may work for like elephants on the savanna, but it, it doesn't work for a cryptic forest bird in the forest. <laughs> So we use this detection probability to help get better estimates of occupancy. So we do two surveys. And you can see on, the, on this side, you have our first survey. And then on the second side, this is just a simple simplification. We have our biometricians. They call themselves biomagicians um, that make the modeling. And again, this is just a sim simple uh, example. But you can see the overall on the left the ones in red we saw twice. We got a goshawk detection in each of those locations. The boxes in purple represent, we missed it. You, you assume goshawks are always in that territory and you should always see them in that sampling unit. So if we see them one time but not the other, we use that information to assume that we're missing them X amount of time. So you can see down there that you assume, okay, well 50 of the plots are occupied and nestling and 38. And then overall, um, if you just do simple math, it's 56%. Um, but in reality, you're not seeing every single goshawk. So you can use that detection probability to fill in that, that extra sampling unit where you're missing it. So then you get a different occupancy. It's actually higher, 63%. So we use that 63% occupancy and we apply it to the whole area. Um, so if we found 17 goshawks and we apply it to so many, to that 600 hectare sampling unit and apply it to the whole forest, we kind of get an idea of um, the occupancy, the density of the birds. Uh, we don't really, we don't really try to estimate specific numbers of birds. Um, we don't try to say, yes, there's 25,000 goshawks in this space, but there's a territory in this amount of the forest. And then the more important thing that we look at are the trends. So in the first year, we might have an occupancy of 63%. The second year, we have an occupancy of 70%. That's good. We like goshawks. We want more of them. If they're like Eurasian collared doves, maybe it's not such a good idea. And there are some things that we can do as you get more information. Um, and, and figure out why populations may be increasing or decreasing. Um, like the part of uh, the bark beetle infestation, um, we might be able to use that information to um, kind of see how that's affecting goshawk populations, especially since we have before a lot of tree death and then we'll have after a lot of tree death. So in region two, again, that's Colorado, um, Wyoming, and, and South Dakota. Overall occupancy, we've done this two years. We did it in 2006 and 2009. We had 33% overall in 2006. It went up in 2009 to 46, so that's good. Um, they do like that primary habitat more consistently, and they don't really care for that marginal habitat consistently. So we can begin to see those trends. And this, this study, this work is supposed to continue for 50 years, uh, but we only do it every three to five years. Unless there's a sequester, then we don't do it. <laughs> so we only have one year for the Southwest. You can tell overall the occupancy is quite a bit lower. Um, it's only 27% overall. So there's less goshawks down in the Southwest than there are in, in Region 2. Um, again, they do like that primary habitat. We did get that right. Um, and then just this is a fun little number. The amount of area that we walked in 2009 um, it's basically walking those transect lines through Denver almost three times. So my technicians walk a lot. <laughs> All right, so I do have a couple other projects. Last year and then this year, I was working with uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish 
on uh, nest searches, so that's really fun. We do the broadcast acoustical surveys, but when we get a detection, uh, we actually look for the nest. And then in t this year, I'm working with the Apache Sit Greaves National Forest, and it's in Arizona, and we're basically doing just forest-wide occupancy. So those big bioregional maps, the number that you get is only good for that huge area, unless you specifically cut down to one of those smaller areas. Um, and that's what we're doing in, in the Apache Sit Greaves this year. So the Wyoming Range, if you don't know where that is in Wyoming, you have the Shoshone that comes down, um, there's Yellowstone up in the corner, and then the Grand Tetons come down. The Wyoming Range is, is south of there. Um, and the way that we're doing those, it's not spatially balanced throughout the whole study area. Our goal is to walk through the, basically the entire forest that has suitable habitat and try to find as many nests as we possibly can. So we applied, we started out with a spatially balanced design, ranked all of those um, PSUs, it's the same size, and then we applied a habitat weighting system to it. So you can see the kind of the black splotchy stuff, that's dog fir and lodgepole pine, which is their primary habitat in this particular area. Um, and the blue stuff means that we want to get to it first. The more red you get, the more we want to do it later. So it's still, it's not really randomized, but it's better than a lot of times science will be like, hey, it's cheap and easy to go to a road. Let's survey that location and then do the one that's eight miles from anywhere later because it's way more expensive to do that later one. So this one helps get rid of that. Um, and it's a pretty map. So once, once we find uh, a nest, we mark it with our GPS unit and on a map. We don't, we don't do anything else with them while there's, while there's birds occupying uh, that territory. But then we go back and we take some, some data from the area. Uh, the nest tree, like, we'll measure the height. This tree is, I think, 110 feet tall, um, and it is... I think 88 years old. So we, we also take that's my partner with Wyoming Game of Fish, that's Susan Patla. She's using an incorporate bore to figure out. She'll, we count the rings in the tree to see out how old it is. And some other things like tree species and that kind of stuff. And then they're going to use that information to help make the forest or help the Forest Service make better decisions um, because they have a lot of overgrowth um, and they really need to go and do some stuff. And one of the examples is. Last year, there was a fire that burned really intensely in this in the study area. Uh, it ended up burning um, 48,000 acres, so 100, 100 square miles, 600, 64,000 acres, which is 100 square miles, and about 40,000 acres was actually in the study area. And we found we had two historic active nests, and the fire burned up both of them. So going in and trying to figure out what to keep and then what to get rid of and help getting rid of that stuff, it should help decrease that intensity so you don't have such huge, um, intense fires destroying everything. All right, and then the Apache Sit Greaves, again, it's just an occupancy, um, nothing terribly exciting, but you can kind of see where the forest is in Arizona. And we're in the beginning stages of that project, so um, I'm attributing all of, you can see all of those are primary sampling units. I'm attributing them uh, with the forest type ownership, and, um, and then that's within the grids. And the, the darker <coughs> green is the ponderosa pine, the brownish color um, are the pinion juniper, and then you can see there's some areas that don't have any uh, forested areas, so we won't survey in those. Um, and then we'll stratify them based on that habitat stuff. The other thing is that there was a 400,000 acre fire, the Wallow Fire in 2011. Um, that was huge. So one of the questions we might ask is, what is the difference in goshawk use uh, in that burned area versus outside that burned area? So we're still working out the details of, should we do it? inside and outside, or just do it throughout the whole forest, or just do the habitat type, or those kinds of things. Um, and then we'll apply that randomly selected, that spatially balanced design, and pull out 20 
just 20 sampling units out of, I don't know, there's like 1,500 in this forest. And that's enough to at least give us a number. And if we do 20, you know, over the next five years, we'll get good trends um, to see kind of what's going on. All right, I think that concludes it. I didn't really go into goshawk natural history or anything, but most of my audiences have been raptor people. So I apologize if you have any questions about goshawks. Um, you got the main points, but I'd be happy to answer them. Do goshawks migrate? Um, yeah. Um, they, 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 the populations where they've put radio transmitters on them have been in the southwest, and there probably isn't a good reason for those goshawks to migrate. Um, the ones that live in the Arctic, prob they do migrate south, um, but they're more, it's more dispersal based on um, competition, like young will be more likely to move because they don't have their territory established. But there is some movement, but nothing, nobody really knows exactly what goes on. So. I, uh, I'm going to brag a little. I saw the boss talk today. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I really, I mean, I've gone out. I haven't seen one in probably three years at least. Yeah. And that, that relates to my question is, can you give us any idea how relatively common boss talks are compared to maybe other birds that were more um, it's so, the nature of how they fly? Yeah, it's the nature. And, and they, they don't, so back to like why, why easy access um, is not necessarily a good idea. They don't like roads. They've done some work in the Sierra Nevadas where they've actually looked at road density and goshawk populations. And as you increase roads, you decrease the populations. So you're less likely to see them. But I get pictures from people, like I got one from a person who lived in Boulder and was like, is this a goshawk in my backyard? And yes, that's a goshawk in your backyard. So they are out there um, in a forest. They're actually in that sampling unit. That, so the reason that that size is that size, it's about their, they nest, in the, they nest and then they have their area that they regularly go out to. The males go out way far to go get food, but the females and the males too, defend kind of that 600 hectares. So for each hectare, you're, there's probably a pair of goshawks there, um, but you have to walk through a lot of forest to kind of see them. Um, and then like in the Kaibab, they actually, every, every mile, you take a mile and there's a goshawk every mile. Um, but you just, yeah, you never see them, unless you're calling and then they wanna, they wanna beat you up, because that's what they like to do. They'll hit, they'll hit you, I mean, they're aggressive. Two questions. One, what's their primary prey? And you can get to that quickly, I'm sure. But the second one is, um, is more, probably more complicated, and that is, given their preference for unroaded forest, um, how does that, how do you square that with what seemed to be your advocacy for a, a active management of that forest up in the Wyoming range? How do you, how do you manage that forest without putting more roads into it. So it's not just a road necessarily. Um, it's more how many people use that road. And most forests aren't going to increase recreational roads at this point in time. Um, they may increase logging roads. Um, and it will probably affect them. It will disturb them. Um, down in the southwest, there are a lot more roads than there are up here, but there's still still an okay population of goshawks. Um, so we couldn't advise the Forest Service not to build roads, but based on like their primary habitat, they may make roads, they may place the roads in better locations. So um, it's kind of like the Keystone Pipeline, instead of going th straight through the Sand Hill Crane areas, they're gonna go around it, and that's just, we all use oil but we don't want it going right through that sensitive area. So, you know, there is a compromise made with it. And that's kind of the best that we can do is just give them that information. Um, and then what their primary prey base um, depends on where they are. They, they eat squirrels, grouse, um, American kestrels. They actually eat a lot of those. Um, and then, again, they, it, it will be interesting to see how the, the, par, the bark beetle infestation really does affect them because they don't eat woodpeckers 
when they have squirrels and bunnies and grouse um, and things, but they don't mind eating them. So because pecker, woodpeckers are just easy targets, um, they may actually do really well because they may just adjust to that, you know, and when you have this kind of thing, you usually have a huge population boom in woodpeckers. So the goshawks might just do just fine with that. Hi, I was wondering, with such an expansive territory to monitor, have you guys considered use, incorporating citizen science into a project like this? And if not, why? If not, so RMBO, we do a lot of citizen science. We do work with Hawk, Hawk Watch. Um, we have a, we do the Dinosaur Ridge down in Denver. We we coordinate that, and then we also do Bald Eagle Watch. So we do, we we like citizen science. Um, one of the things about just a huge space is trying to get people to go to that location. So if I were to ask this room, hey, how many of you guys would like to go down to the border of Mexico next week? <laughs> This is a special group, but you know it's um, and then you know for a you know for a week you know kind of a thing you get people who are doing stuff, um, and then the amount of training that goes into looking for goshawks, um, a lot of people uh, think it's great to go spend a summer hiking around in the wilderness, but then they spend a week out there and then they realize it's not the best um, way. But I do have internships and I do get people who you know basically volunteer for me. Um, for the summer and they do help me and what I do depending on those locations um, you know I, I group technicians in a location so I don't have a technician go down to Mexico and then go all the way up to South Dakota I have a group that's in South Dakota and then they may go to the Big Horns in Wyoming you know a group that's in the Shoshone a group that's in you know the White River National Forest um, so that helps but the other thing is that weather is a big component of surveys um, and trying to get people to go out and do something in the middle of nowhere and then they get rained out is, is kind of a lot to ask of just citizen science. I have a more general bird question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you sometimes help people put feeders out in their backyards mm -hmm. and I've noticed around here that uh, wherever there are feeders there are lots and lots of birds gathering and I'm mm -hmm. curious how feeders, uh, the feeders that we put out affect bird behavior in the Rockies. They, I don't know if I'm the best person, I can give you my theories behind it. I don't think anybody's actually looked at that but um, most of the birds that are going to come to feeders um, are going to be, you know, they're going to be generalists, they're going to be okay with urban or rural suburban areas anyway. Um, again, my, my master's in biomedical science and I, got, I did work with West Nile virus and stuff, so then I think maybe that concentration will increase um, disease prevalence or the spread of disease. And sometimes you do see that, so it is important if you do have feeders to make sure that they're clean because salmonella and avian pox is transmittable in feeders. Um, so. Again, I mean, most of the birds that it's going to increase are cool. Some of them are not, like uh, house sparrows. Um, but house, house sparrows are just kind of here to stay. So you might as well try to get cool birds in um, and just look at the house sparrows. House sparrows. Oh. There was. Could you imitate the call of a goshawk? Uh, well, here. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm not a very good. <laughs> It's a it's a ka 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 yeah, yeah. And then and then the whale the like the the juvenile they have a whale call it's a it's a whale I mean it's and and then um, yeah they don't there's nothing pretty about any noise that they make so uh, there's no whistling or anything but they're loud they're loud and intense. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys for coming down here, and I want to thank Jenny for making the trip once again. I'm sure if anyone has any last-minute questions, she'd be happy to hang out here for a few minutes and answer them. I want to invite all of you back next week for our final Naturalist Nights, and it is our Changing Forest Monitoring, monitoring Local Forest Health. And you can ask them how it's going to affect goshawks. There you go. <laughs> Let Jenny know. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you.